Uh, you can turn to 2 Corinthians with me. Um, why don't you come to 2 Corinthians chapter... Come to uh, chapter 11. And I'm going to read verses... Eighteen through thirty-three, just to get our minds going. Uh, we're continuing to survey uh, certain passages in Second Corinthians that deal with some comforting doctrine as we've been going through our suffering series. Uh, and so we started that last week. I really do plan on getting it done uh, tonight. And so if I see the clock going, we're going to be rushing through it because I want to uh, make sure we're in uh, chapter twelve by next week. And uh, because I want to move on in this series, Uh, most of the doctrine, not that there isn't other doctrine involved with suffering, but most of the doctrine and the the weight of the doctrine when it comes to our suffering series, we've already really gone over. Uh, We're just going to kind of touch on chapter 12, but our Father does that. A lot of the things that He does within our edification, uh, a lot of the work and the labor that is involved is involved in the foundational type things. And uh, he, he does that for specific reasons, and there's genius involved in that. Not that there isn't work or labor involved uh, with the, the rest of the edification and the doctrine involved with that, but uh, the foundation is the most important because that's what it's going to be built upon. And if you have a foundation built, a proper foundation built on any issue, uh, such as this issue of suffering, then what's going to be built upon it, you can be able to see what aligns and what matches. Uh, but if you don't have that foundation down and you don't understand some fundamental things that we've gone through when it comes to this issue of suffering and God dealing with us as adults, that suffering is going to take place. He calls them the sufferings of this present time. The, we're going to experience sufferings uh, the, uh, that are common to man. Everyone's going to face them. Even when you're a Christian, that doesn't change. You don't get uh, some kind of God's favor and things like that. That's how he dealt with Israel underneath that law as children. But that's not the way he's dealing with us today as members of the body of Christ, as, uh, uh, as he's building up the church of the body of Christ. And so, again, again, there's, there's a lot of foundational things that we've really gone through. And uh, not that I plan on trying to pick up the speed a little bit faster as we go on. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but the, as far as the doctrine, it's, it's, we're going to now start being building upon that. And so issues that we've already described and we've gone through should ought to be, ought to be settled. If they're not, uh, then what we, what we go forward is, is not going to make the uh, impact and effect it's designed to make. And so uh, as we get into Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and so on there. And so, again, chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians is kind of the next major section that I want to look at as we go through the suffering series. But we're going to take a look at some other passages tonight before we, we do that. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 18 with me. We'll get into the context a little bit more uh, as we go on tonight, but I'll read verse 18 through 33. We'll pray and get our study underway. Verse 18, Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, when, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In, in prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. 
Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and, uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under er, 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 Eretus, the king kept the city of the... the, the uh, how do you pronounce that? Damascenes, Damascenes, with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you again for this time. Father, I, we're so grateful to be able to uh, come together and meet to go through your word. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That how that he did die for our sins, was buried and rose again. And if anyone listening has not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he did take the debt and penalty of their sin at Calvary on that cross, he took upon himself the wrath, and in connection with it, satisfied your justice. And that he rose again because death cannot hold him. And he was that qualified substitute redeemer to take the place of mankind. Father, we, we, we thank you that you offer that gift of the satisfaction of your justice, of your, of your wrath no longer being against us, the forgiveness of our sins, and the, the imputation of your righteousness to our account solely based upon what Christ did for us and our faith in him and no works at all. Father, we thank you for that. I pray that if anyone has not trusted in Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, that they would do it this very moment and trust exclusively in the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the many things that we have in Christ after we have become justified in your sight and have now been imputed your righteousness. We thank you for our sanctified identification in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are dead to sin and alive unto you and we have this newness of life that we are to live. And one of the things that you've given us the capacity and the power to endure and the comforting doctrine uh, to be had and to uh, attain to uh, is this issue of suffering, to be able to suffer with Christ. And Father, as we've gone through these things and gone through so many wonderful aspects of looking at this suffering, we know that you're not going to deliver us. You didn't deliver Paul. That that worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And Father, I pray as we get into our study and we start to renew our minds and start thinking about everything that we've gone over, that our thinking and that spirit of faith would start to be activated in our inner man and that we would start moving toward what Paul's going to eventually start dealing with in chapter 12 and take pleasure in these infirmities because we understand with the eyes of our understanding, not our physical eyes, we understand what's going on Unto your, that's redounding to your glory. So Father, I thank you for these things. And as we get into Philippians, you talk about these sufferings as a gift that they're given to us, and that we can have fellowship with them and in them, in your, in, in, the son, your, uh, in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as we get into our study tonight, I pray that we would apply our heart to understanding these things, that we wouldn't just come to fill a seat, but that we would come with our minds ready, with our, with our hearts primed, uh, as we apply our heart to understanding these matters set before us. Father, we thank you for, the, for all these things. And we, may we not be constrained in our bowels like the Corinthians were when it came to this issue, but that we would be enlarged and esteem these things very highly because your glory in ours is at stake. Father, we thank you for all these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, we've been going through uh, 2 Corinthians we spent quite a bit of time in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, and we've been dealing now since, basically since the transition from Brother Ron to myself uh, on Thursday nights, been going through the suffering series, and it's a very important issue. Uh, it's a very important issue to understand, especially when you see how the world deals with sufferings. It's a very important issue when you see how Christianity deals with sufferings. And uh, both of those ways... Isn't how God deals with sufferings today in this dispensation of grace? And so we've been taking a look at that very issue, looking at key passages like Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 4, I believe it was, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 4, and we're going to survey the rest of these chapters, and then we're going to eventually get to 2 Corinthians 12, that lay and, and, and lay the foundation 
specifically when it comes to this issue of suffering. Again, as, as we understand that God has two programs in his word uh, with the nation of Israel and with the church of the body of Christ, there's, there's, uh, sometimes there's similarities, but most of the time there's quite a bit of difference because they're two different programs. An entity, the nation of Israel, to uh, reconcile the earth back unto himself and an entity, the church of the body of Christ, to reconcile the heavenly place back unto himself. The heaven and earth aren't the same thing. Therefore, his program with each entity is not the same thing. Therefore, his word that is directed to each of those uh, in those programs is not the same thing. Again, there's some similarities, but we need to rightly divide those issues and be a workman to gain the profit out of both programs. And so we've been doing that. When it comes to this issue of suffering, when it comes to our Apostle Paul, God has designed his epistles, Romans through Philemon, in a very specific order. And he uses this term edification, a uh, term of building. And when you build, you build a foundation. Well, Romans through Galatians serves as that foundation. We're simply taking one issue out of that, this issue of suffering, kind of spotlighting it and gaining the foundation doctrine when it comes to suffering. And so that's what we've been doing. And we're, gonna, we're starting to wrap this up. And it's important that you understand this process of edification because you can't just go to Ephesians and get superstructure doctrine without getting the foundation. You might get a little bit of understanding. Don't get me wrong. Read that. That's good. You want to get that reading uh, in you and you want to have that word in you. But as far as that understanding goes, that, that deep understanding of what God's doing in those epistles isn't going to be had unless you have the foundation. That's the way it's designed. That's the, there's order and sense and sequence to God's word. He's an, he's an author. He doesn't haphazardly put together his book. And he's got some wonderful design. And, and, wonderful, and, and it goes hand in hand with how he created your inner man. He takes you step by step along to build you up, to conform you to the image of Christ. And to conform you to the image of Christ is not any old thing. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, his son. The, the express person of himself. And so there's some wonderful things. And so that's what we're doing when it comes to this issue of suffering is, is that foundation. Uh, if you look at 2 Corinthians, uh, look at chapter 6 with me. That's where we left off last time. 2 Corinthians starts to uh, spotlight, highlight this issue when it comes to uh, this, another form of suffering. Not only the sufferings that are common to man, the sufferings of this present time, but the sufferings of Christ. The sufferings that direct that are directly related to your making known the gospel and the truth of God's word and the uh, the mystery of the gospel and those types of things, Satan has a policy of evil against that very thing. Therefore, when you make known the gospel, make known His truth in any uh, in any doctrine that's involved with it, what, it, that's contained in Romans through Philemon, and there's some kind of backlash. That's where suffering is going to come from. And those are the sufferings of Christ. Those are sufferings that aren't common to man. Those are only sufferings that are given to you as a Christian, as a, a justified person in Christ, uh, only can experience those. And they're given to you. A, 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 an ordinary man cannot partake in those sufferings. He can't. He's not in Christ to be able to, to partake in the sufferings of Christ. And so that's what we've been dealing with specifically in 2 Corinthians because 2 Corinthians, the, 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 in 1 Corinthians, Paul had to strain them out. They didn't want to make known the gospel and they were corrupting the word and they were changing the message so it wasn't so offensive and therefore they wouldn't have to suffer. And so Paul, as he gets into 2 Corinthians, they've been straightened out and they're making known the gospel now in, in truth. And Paul, and now they're starting to suffer but they're starting, to, they're, they're starting to experience it and not so sure about it. And so Paul has to come along and deal with all these issues as well as provide for them the comforting doctrine that's designed to work in them in the suffering, in the tribulation. To provide an endurance for them to keep going on in their faith and in making known the gospel and so that they wouldn't faint. Well, we left off in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And look at verse 11. He says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. You are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own bowels. 
Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be also enlarged. Paul, he gets this point, he's dealt with a lot of comforting things up until this point. But now he comes along and he tells them that they're constrained in their bowels. And we briefly talked about this, and I'll briefly mention it again. The bowels, you have the physical bowels and you have spiritual bowels. The bowels being talked about here are spiritual. But our physical bowels, uh, they, they can either be constrained or enlarged. Uh, <clears throat> you can have some physical bowel problems, some physical ailments inc- that go along with your bowels because uh, your food doesn't settle, you know, doesn't, your bowels don't accept the food. It doesn't like the food that you're eating or whatever it is. There's some likes and dislikes involved with the physical bowels. Well, there's likes and dislikes when it comes to your spiritual bowels. And when the truth gets down, when you get down to the, the, the radical root issue of the bowels, our bowels, our spiritual bowels should be, should be the bowels of Jesus Christ. Everything God our Father through the Lord Jesus Christ highly esteems, we should esteem. No matter, no matter what. We live unto Him now. We present our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, which is our reasonable service. And so we ought to enlarge ourselves to the things that He has before us because there's glory involved. And so <clears throat> these Corinthians, when it came to this issue of suffering... They were constrained, and naturally so. Uh, your flesh has a natural aversion from sufferings, as well as you have a whole other program in God's Word that tell you that there's a deliverance from sufferings. That we're going to see men were coming in and, 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 and preaching that very thing, when that's not at all what God's doing. He's not delivering you from the sufferings, but He's going to deliver you in the suffering. He's going to provide an inward tranquility of your, your inner man so that you can endure through the sufferings. And that's a form of power. It's an excellency of his power. It's a superior power that God is putting on display. It's nothing for God to deliver someone from tribulation. I mean, that's... But actually, to have the tribulation go on and a, and a power working within a believer to go through the tribulation... And not be terrified by anything uh, that the adversary can produce against them. That's a manifestation of his superior power. And that's what you and I, in this dispensation, have the honor and privilege of uh, putting on display. Well, these Corinthians were strained uh, in their bowels when it came to this issue. I just want to simply bring that up. Uh, come with me to uh, chapter 10. We're going we're gonna to skip a, a few chapters in chapter 7. Uh, You should spend some time in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and see what Paul does uh, in there and and how he's comforted by the coming of Titus. How he receives comfort by another member of the Church of the Body of Christ, one of his his sons in the faith. Uh, He's comforted by his coming. And he talks about prayer and things like that. And he alludes back to chapter 1 and chapter 4. And how there's prayer involved, the thanksgiving of many. And how there's this wonderful dynamic in prayer of of praying for someone's comfort and providing a doctrine for someone's comfort in their inner man that redounds to God's glory as well. Not only can you manifest the the wonderful excellency of his power of the doctrine of of God's word effectually working in you in the suffering and, and that redound to God's glory. But in someone else's suffering, you can pray for their comfort and that to redound in their glory. And there's some labor involved in in that prayer. You go on in Colossians and he he talks about a brother. I forget his name off the top of my head right now. But uh, it might be uh, Epaphroditus. Don't quote me on that. Who, uh, Who labored fervently in his prayers for some saints. And there's labor involved with that, but that is redounding to God's glory. Uh, uh, A verbal expression of the doctrine on someone else's behalf redounds to God's glory. You're putting that on display even though you're not going through that suffering. And so there's some there's a wonderful uh, some things that are involved in in chapter seven uh, there. But look at chapter. Uh, in, in chapter 8 and 9, he deals with supplying the want of other churches. Uh, how it's not only 
uh, when it comes to comfort and financial things, um, being able to provide a, a comfort and financial giving to other churches who have a need, uh, that's a, 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 a sacrifice that you're giving on, on your behalf, but it's a producing a comfort. And that's, that's just very generally, I, I mean, that's very generally talking about Roman, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. But look at chapter 10, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter, you, you didn't think I was going to do it, where, did you? You didn't think I was going to, you're like, chapter 10 already, we skipped yeah. two chapters. In chapter 10, remember, when I brought up this issue of suffering, there's a lot of other, it's kind of like a, it's, it's kind of like a plant. And when you have a plant and you, and you pull it out, there's all these other roots. When it comes to this issue of suffering, that plant, you pull it out, and there's a whole bunch of other things involved with it, such as preaching the gospel. That's where the sufferings of Christ come from. Preaching the gospel, uh, the, the warfare that we're involved with. with, with we're gonna, that's what eventually what we're going to get into. The, the glory that redounds unto God and that worketh for us. And, and so there's a, a couple other issues that are involved with that Paul has to deal with. Uh, one again, one of these issues in making known the gospel, making known the, the mystery of the gospel and these types of things. What's going to also come alongside that is uh, men who don't share that message. The men who corrupt that message. And so Paul is going to deal with that issue too. Well, that's what he starts to get in. Uh, the issue he starts to get into in chapter 10 here. Look at verse 1. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in, in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with, uh, with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not... What's that next word? War. war after the flesh. Paul understood he was engaged in a war. He was engaged in a fight. Let that sink in. Now, it's not a war in a fight that you might be acquainted with. A, a, a physical fight in battle. Paul knew what was taking place, the, the fight of the inward man and, and, and the thoughts and the doctrine, the doctrine of devils and seducing spirits that are designed to, to affect, and, and, uh, affect your inner man and cause you to faint. And everywhere Paul went, he faced this issue. He faced this war. There wasn't a place. Remember when we went and we talked about he was troubled on every side? That was a physical thing, but that was also an inward thing. That was a, this war that he was going through. And it's like he was in the middle of the battlefield, and every which way he faced, there's an army there and strongholds there that are right up against him. And this is important when it comes to this issue of suffering. He doesn't war. Uh, he doesn't war after the flesh. Verse four. Again, we can't. We're not going to get into the real detail of these things, but I want you to be made aware of them uh, as we go through them. Verse four. For the weapons of our warfare are not what carnal. You can't fight this war with any kind of carnal, fleshly, external weapon. Your, 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 your weapons of, of, of this warfare are not carnal. But notice how he describes them. But mighty through God to pulling down of strongholds. Paul understood there was these many, there, there were many strongholds. What's a, what's a stronghold? A fortress. A fortress, yeah. What, 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 is, what is it designed to do? To keep people out, hold. Yeah, it's got a couple purposes, doesn't it? Yeah, when I think of a, a stronghold, you know, I think of, uh, I think, it, it, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, you think of a, a wall. It's kind of got two purposes: one to protect what's behind you, and also to, to, in in light of that, also keep people out. There's a, there's a, there, it's a stronghold, and and just the terminology, a stronghold. It's a, it's a stronghold. It's, it's something that's. Uh, designed to keep a hold of you in, in a strong capacity. 
And, and, and this warfare, the adversary's tactics that are against you are designed to do that very thing. And we're going to see it takes place a lot of the time by his doctrines of devils and seducing spirits to affect your thinking. And it's a stronghold. And if you don't think that there's no stronghold in your mind, I pray that you humble yourself and realize there's many ways in which the adversary has probably got a stronghold in your mind. If not by his other doctrines that you hear within Christianity, if not by also by the inroads that the world has upon you. This is the very thing that our Heavenly Father is do, in, in edif, uh, edifying us is to get us out of. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your tendency is to be conformed to the world. And it's only through the, 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 uh, the Holy, sport, uh, Holy, Sp- Holy Sport, Holy Sport leading you, <laughs> Holy Spirit leading you through the doctrine. That is gonna, it's gonna tear down those strongholds and transform you by the renewing of your mind and conform you to the image of Christ, so that you'd be godly, think like God thinks, live, uh, in, live like God lives, and labor with Him in what He's doing. Look at what look what he goes on to say in verse five as he further goes on to further explain this. Casting down what? Imaginations. I don't know if you remember in Romans 1 in our Sunday series when we talked about the the course of this world that the adversary uh, produced and how God gave over the the nations because they gave themselves over to lasciviousness and those types of things. And this course of this world was established and God gave uh, the Gentiles over to this. And one of the characteristics that led to that giving over was that they became vain in their imaginations. It's a hallmark uh, identifier of an ungodly person, an unrighteous person, one who just lives in the world has, has lots of imaginations, lots of thoughts that don't have any authority, don't have any truth to them. And maybe have some little bit of truth, but mixed with a lot of untruth and a lot of falsehood. But nevertheless, it's an imagination. It's just, you think something. And I go through this every single day when I read the Bible. I think something and I come to God's word and it could just be one little word that changes my mind about a specific issue. One word. And I had an imagination. I just automatically assumed or I thought that's what it ought to be. Whatever the issue is. I'm just talking very generally here. But does it line up with God's word? Every word. And there's these imaginations and you can hear them all the time. When you get more uh, saturated in the doctrine and move on in your edification and have that level of understanding that God's designed for you to have and you hear other brethren and sister and talk and they have some thought and you might hear a comment, well, I don't know if there's any validity in the Bible of this. Well, get it. Well, I don't know if this is true. Well, then get it. Because what you're going off of then is just your own imagination. And you're not going to outthink God. You're not going to go to the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, this is what I thought that I thought was pretty good. You're going to be judged based upon your thinking is aligned with His. And when it comes to this issue of suffering, is your thinking aligned with His? The issues that we've been going through, have you enlarged yourself to them? And again, I told you, this is a foundation because if you don't get this, when Paul says he takes pleasure in affirmities, that he rejoices in them and all these things, as he's going to later go on, it's not going to mean too much to you. It's just not. You can come along and read that and say, wow, that's really good. Paul, he he can rejoice in suffering. But for you to have it effectually work in you, you've got to have the foundation. And if there's an imagination when it comes to this suffering, and it's going to come by, Paul's already dealt with, one, by the adversary going back and teaching Israel's program when it comes to this issue of suffering, dealing with you as a child and him delivering you from sufferings or the sufferings from you based upon your performance. 
which is what Christianity is marked by and is in a spiritual bedlam in, they think that based upon their external situation circumstance, they have favor or not have favor with God. They're in a good standing or not in good standing with God and not realizing who they are in Christ. And they think that, oh, because I'm going through this and I, and I lost my job, I must have sinned. God's not operating that way. He's not. That's an imagination you have. And it needs to be cast down in order for you to, to be godly in this area. Or if things are going well, well, I must be doing something right. It's not the way it works. It's not the way that God's dealing with us today. And it runs rampant out there. And that doctrine of the devil and his seducing spirit come along and teach that very thing. <clears throat> but we've got to cast down that imagination. He goes on. And every high thing that exalteth, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. We've learned the knowledge of God when it comes to this area. If there's something that exalts itself, uh, if he gives you a truth about suffering that you're going to go through and those types of things. And again, we're just, I, I feel bad in a sense because we're just generally going through these things, but I'm just trying to get my, the, the point across that he's getting to. If he's giving you the truth and, and, and talked about the knowledge of God and those types of things when it comes to this issue of suffering, everything else, again, that stems from that imagination is something that is a, is a high thing that exalteth, exalteth itself against God, against the knowledge of God. Remember again in Romans 1, he dealt with those un ungodly, uh, uh, unjustified men there in Romans 1, and it talked about how they professed, they, they knew God, but they glorified him not of God. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, birds, four footed beasts, and creeping things, and they professed themselves to be wise. With their foolish heart was darkened, but they professed themselves to be wise. But really, they were fools. They exalted their own knowledge above the knowledge of God. Well, same thing when it comes to this issue that we've been dealing with. I love this last statement here in verse 5. And bringeth into captivity, what are the next two words? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ, which gen very generally put, is Romans through Philemon. What he's teaching you, it's Paul, Paul's penning it, Paul's speaking, and things like that. But it's the Lord Jesus Christ teaching you, as well as our Heavenly Father. And he's obeying, this, he's obeying the doctrine. As you're an adult son and daughter of God, Christ is the Son of God. And his edification and things like that and what he's uh, going through right now, we ought to be going through that same, going through that same thing. And so any, we need to bring uh, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And you can do it because every thought is right here. Just go through the edification, take God's word. It's... it's it's, you're not, it's not going to happen. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's just going to happen like that. It's, it's time. It's a, it's a building up process. It's a sanctification process. But nevertheless, you go through it, and, and, and it's going to take place. And your thoughts are going to line up with God's thoughts. Look at verse 6. Look at the attitude. And having in a, uh, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Simply put, having in your readiness, when, you, when, you, when there's some kind of disobedience, as far as the doctrine comes, and you realize you have an imagination, uh, you have a, a thought that isn't the thought of God, and these types of things that you would have in your readiness to revenge that disobedience and be obedient and change your mind. In the matter, that's what God's. That's what God. How God wants you to respond to when you realize you've been wrong in a matter. Don't rear up your pride and try to prove something that's not there. Admit you're wrong and and revenge that disobedience by by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and be obedient in it. 
You want to be like, be godly, then that's what's at stake. Don't let your mind, don't let your flesh get in the way. Your fleshly mind, I should say. Let the word of God raise you. And let the word of God effectually work in you. You believe it. Look at verse 7. Do ye look on things after the what? Outward, outward appearance. He, just already, he already went through chapter 4. The inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man perish. Well, these, these Corinthians, because of some men that crept in, they started to look at the outward appearance. A lot of things are involved with that, but nevertheless, you get the, you get the point. The outward appearance, if any man trust in himself that he is Christ, let him uh, self-think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I, shouldn't, uh, I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Notice this issue of verse 8, that he has... He should boast of uh, he should have a, more of a boast because of the, of his authority to edify them and not destroy them not not authority to, to for destruction but for edification. Well, there are men coming who have an outward appearance of things, a good show in the flesh, teaching things that they don't have to suffer and you don't you can be delivered and and get your healing and and and, and all these things that they're coming along and preaching another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel along with that, have their doctrine and devil and a spiritual phenomena seducing spirit to validate their message, which isn't God's message. And it's destroying them. It's destroying them and they don't even know it because the adversary, Satan himself, has transformed himself into an angel of light. I'm I'm jumping ahead, but uh, actually I have to go back, but He's already actually talked about this, as, as we'll see. Oh, I'm sorry, no, we're in chapter 10. In chapter 11, he's going to explain this. But they're, they're, they're looking at the outward appearance, and it's destroying them and not edifying them. And what Paul says and what, how he has to teach on this issue of suffering, that's what's going to edify them. That's what's going to build up their inner man. That's going to work for them a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. And that's what's going to redound to God's glory. Look at verse 12. Just, just, uh, just a statement that Paul makes. For we dare, not, uh, we dare not make ourselves of the what? Number. Or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Remember in chapter 3, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 with me real quick. Verse 1. He says, do we begin again to, uh, to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? He, he's already been, they've already commended themselves to the Corinthians. They should have been commended, the Corinthians sh- should have commended the Apostle Paul. But you had guys come in who had letters of commendation. Fancy stuff. An outward appearance. Instead of looking at the real issues of who the Apostle Paul is. And that's what eventually Paul has to get into in these latter chapters here. It's his authority as he's just talked about. For edification, not destruction. And and he he becomes a fool in glorying and in boasting in some things. But it's not his outward appearance. It's not his credentials as far as... uh, the signs, miracles, and wonders, but it's his credentials when it comes to the issue of his, what would you think it would be? Suffering. His suffering. That's what he's going to focus upon. Come back to uh, chapter 10, verse 12 there, after the colon. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not what? Wise. You got guys comparing themselves among themselves. You have guys commending themselves. And notice again that first statement, for we dare not make ourselves of the what? Number. That's a, it's a statement that there was, this was a common problem. 
And Paul knew that every... He's talking to believers here, by the way. Every church that he was going into had imaginations, had thoughts, high, every high thing and exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And there were strongholds that he was going to deal with. And Paul, he's, he's saying it because they got him. And there's men coming in who are teaching that are providing for the manufacturing of that stronghold and ungodly thoughts that don't line up with God's thoughts through Paul. Uh, look at, come with me to chapter 11 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, we're just surveying these things. Uh, I'm not doing them any justice by any means. Nevertheless, uh, hopefully the point is, is, is coming across. Uh, look at chapter 11, verse 1. Again, he has to deal with now these, these, this, the number who commend themselves, compare themselves with one another, uh, who present an authority, but is really destroying their edification compared to Paul's authority, which is designed for edification. He's now going to come along and expose these guys and, 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 and do some things in connection with this. Verse 1, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my what? Folly. He's going to go through some folly and he says, bear with me. Just, just bear with, humor me. He says, and indeed bear with me. Verse 2, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. This isn't an improper jealousy to try to get disciples and more people uh, unto them so Paul can get more money. You're going to see Paul didn't have any money. He, everywhere he went, he, he, uh, he wouldn't be chargeable unto the saints. He would work for his food. He would work for his lodging and still give them the word of God freely. But, uh, but these guys would come along and they, that they, wanted, they were jealous over these people to, to take them in and, and take their money and, and to, to have recognition and reputation among their, their following and things like that. But God was jealous over them with a godly jealousy. He has an authority given to him by God to edify them, to build them up and conform them, not to his image, not to commend them to unto him, but to Christ's image. And he has a godly jealousy. He says, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We're not going to get into that. He's not talking about we're the bride of Christ or any of those things there. Uh, but we're not going to get into that. Verse 3 is where I want to get. But I, what? Fear. Lest by, what are those next two words? Any means. Notice that. Any means. We're, we're going to have to do it maybe after 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll get into how Satan has the ability to counterfeit the power of God. He has... There's some things that you probably wouldn't even think about that, that Satan's able to do. If you remember back there all the way to Exodus, uh, when Moses goes into unto Pharaoh... And he says, let my people go. And, and God gave him the, the, the rod. The rod that was going to change into a, a serpent and all those things. Well, you know, the priests had rods as well. They didn't just have one rod. There was rods. And there might not just have been two priests. There might have been a lot more priests. And you know, their rods were changed into a serpent. Ever thought about that? A rod, a dead thing being changed into a living thing. Folks, God, Satan has the ability to resurrect something, give life. He's going to do it out here. This prophet and all those things, when he, when he dies, he's going to raise him from the dead. Don't think that you hear all these stories about resurrection. That's from God. You'll be beguiled. You'll be fooled. And God's made it plain and clear, that's not the way I'm operating today in this dispensation of grace. I'm not dealing with that. 
I'm not. That's Israel's program. And there's some things out here that they're going to be doing and they got the, the believing remnant has to be able to discern so that they're not beguiled by the delusion and the signs and wonders that the Antichrist puts together. Well, that, that same Satan out there who's going to be manifest in the flesh, he's the same guy out here. And he's, that's, that's, that's Exodus. That's that's your, the second Genesis X. That's the second book of your Bible. He's had a lot of time to hone his skills for this dispensation. And the whole healing and, and, and gifts of healings. If you ever read that passage, it's the gifts of healings. There's a lot there. And, and, and that goes all into... To, in the bear, but there's also one other thing that we'll we, we'll go through these things eventually. But with the during the gospel accounts, when the Lord's earthly ministry and Christ is there and He's casting out devils, and the Pharisees say He casts out devils devils by Be- Belzebub, Beelzebub, well, however you ever pronounce that, right? And he goes all into talking. If you go read that passage, I don't have the top of my head. We'll eventually go through it. You'll read that passage and he says, your fathers, talk to the Pharisees. That the Pharisees are casting out devils, but they're doing it by a Beelzebub. You would look at them outward. You see Jesus casting out devils. The Pharisees casting out devils. The one is of the father, their devil. The Pharisees are. Jesus is. He's, he's, He's the express person of God, his father. They're both casting out devils. Counterfeit. And so don't, don't think that the adversary doesn't have a lot of power to do things. He has a lot of power to do things. And that's any means. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. How did the serpent beguile Eve? I should say, what is one of the ways? You can be like God. You can be like God. Yep. By the eyes. Seen. By the eyes. Yep, that's one way. Corrupting the word of God. Yeah. Corrupting the word of God. And again, I talk about that doctrine of devils there, he tells Timothy, and seducing spirits. That all goes into uh, someone who claiming that they have authority uh, uh, and they come along and they have a doctrine, but they have a, a seducing spirit that's involved with a spiritual phenomena, a sign, miracle, and wonder to come along to validate their message. And Paul knew that's what he's up against. Paul knew that, hey, I can do a sign, miracle, and wonder to validate my authority, give you my message, and this guy's going to come in and do the same exact thing, but he's corrupting the Word of God. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. A subtlety is, when you, when you talk about subtlety, it gets to this issue of uh, my, minute, uh, a, a keen change. A very small change, a, a, a subtlety, a, a, a tactic. You're, you're very subtle. You have a very uh, good way to kind of get out of things. And, and, and you can just you know, kind of get out, get out of it, just kind of sneak out. You're very subtle. It gets down to minute. And when it comes to the Word of God, it's just a very minute change. That's why you got to make sure you have the right Bible. That's why you got to make sure that you have... You understand God's word rightly divided. Otherwise, you're going to be back in Israel's program when you're not supposed to be back in Israel's program. You have, you're have you part of another program. But very subtle change in God's word to beguile you. And look what it goes on. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4. For if I... Uh, for if he that cometh preacheth another... He knows that someone's going to come... And preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if ye receive another spirit, 
which ye have not received, or another gospel that ye might not, uh, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. What's going to take place is these guys that come in are going to have just their own false Jesus. They just make them up. Or they're going to talk about <clears throat> Jesus before the dispensation of grace. Or they're going to go out here and grab verses of Jesus out here in the, in the tribulation period in the kingdom and all these things and try to apply them to you today. That's how they're going to try to get you back in Israel's program. Another Jesus. another, And notice what he says. Uh, or if you receive another spirit. That's a lowercase s. And we've been talking about this lowercase s that he's dealt with in 2 Corinthians 3 as well as chapter 4 when he talked about that spirit of faith. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he talks about the spirit which is, of, which is of God. Lowercase s. Not the Holy Spirit, but the spirit which is of God. We'll eventually uh, deal with that as we get there on Sundays. But, uh, but in a whole other spirit. And that last statement of verse 4, ye might well bear with him. Meaning, he, he, the reason why Paul's fearing is because this guy is going to come in and another Jesus spirit, gospel, all these things, and they're going to bear well with this guy. They're going to hear him out. And they're going to, they're prone because Paul knows these Corinthians have a very great tendency to follow after these men, follow after this guy. <clears throat> and he's got the authority, he's got the whole package. Come with me to, uh, he's got a few more minutes. Look at verse, look at verse 12, verse 11. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. He's talking about these, these guys here again. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Paul's got a heart for even these guys. He's hoping that he would, uh, that he would find these, these guys. He would cut off occasion, but that they would also uh, change their mind to be found even as the Apostle Paul and things like that. <clears throat> Wish we could deal with that more. Verse 13, he's going to go on to explain though who these guys really are. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself transformed into an angel, uh, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I told uh, some of the brothers last Thursday, I said, if Satan was right here and standing in front of you, you would think he was of God. That he was from God, an angel of light. You know, he always he talks about, the, in, in Timothy there, he talks about the, the, the Christ in, the, in his glory and the light that no man can approach unto. And then you have an angel of light here who is very willing to show himself and his cohorts, an angel of light. And you always hear these accounts and all these things. Of, I, I saw a light. There was just a bright light. And they, get, and they think that they're more spiritual or they have some kind of spiritual phenomena or they've experienced something. They don't have the doctrine. They don't have the doctrine even if they to experience one of those things. If I experience one of those things because of the doctrine, I would say that's of the adversary. That's, that's not of God. God's word doesn't tell me that. I don't care if I can see something. The whole, everything he's been teaching me, it's a spirit of faith, eyes of understanding, not my physical eyes. So when all those things come along and, 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 get, and, and provide for you to have the ability to walk by sight and that emotional feeling and all these things, that's what the adversary is going to utilize. That's what he's going to produce and propagate. And you have the doctrine to be able to come along, to stand upon, and to, to tear down that stronghold of that experience. My wife, it, um, before she learned right division, and before when we were dating and we were going through some things, she was 
uh, very much, you know, she was r- raised charismatic and things like that. And she tells me stories about things that she saw, that she experienced. And she's my wife, I, I believe her. <laughs> she, she saw the gold dust and the feathers coming down just out of nowhere. She, she ex- experienced people speaking in tongues. I don't deny that those things don't take place. I don't deny if someone in a third world country and someone, uh, uh, someone claim a prophet or whatever is out there and they raise someone from the dead. I don't deny that that physically with my eyes I witnessed and experienced. I don't deny that it didn't happen. I, I, I could see it. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You gotta stand on his word that tells you what's taking place is not from him. And folks, people get wrapped up in that. They go to one, uh, they need this experiences one after another, and that's what their whole Christian life is made up of. And I wasn't as deep into that, but I was in, I was in the same thing, in a similar type thing where you had to get that next, that next high or that next uh, feeling or next experience, a next emotion to come along and tell you that you're spiritual, to come along and tell you you have favor with God, to come along and tell you that you have a good standing before God, not understanding some fundamental things in Romans uh, chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, when he comes along and deals with your justification of how he sees you in Christ right in his sight. You have a sanctified position in Christ. One that is able to live unto him to accept his word, uh, his word give you the capacity to live unto him uh, and provide for you every spiritual blessing. And that's what you need, the spiritual blessings. And I don't say that I'm, I'm mad at some people who are just willful in that. And you can share the truth with them and they come along and say, well, I experienced this. And they don't even care about what the word of God is. But there's some people who are just in that and don't have any idea. And they're just being led and just being destroyed. And it's, it's their responsibility too, but nevertheless... Look at verse 15 as we, as we wind down here. It says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of, not unrighteousness, ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I'm going to read down through where we uh, read last time to verse 18. He says, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Paul, as he talks about this being a fool and foolishly, it's because he's going to start to boast himself a little he's going to kind of talk about his accolades compared to these guys accolades and all these things and he talks about how you suffer these fools why don't you suffer me as a fool too and listen to what i have to say and bear well with me but he talks about you suffer these guys they they bring you into bondage they devour you they take of you they they exalt themselves and they smite you on the face whether that's a, a, a physical intimidation tactic of, of, a, of a smiting on the face so that you would believe their message, or whether it was, a, you know, you, you, you see these, uh, these, these guys who actually, you know, they, they put their hand on you and they, you know, they smite you on the face and they do all the, the, that kind of stuff and, and, to, and they, you, you, the falling over and all these things and they, they smite you on the face, they, take, they exalt himself. Big guys, big money involved, exalting himself. He's he's the one guy talking uh, and the one guy doing all the stuff in front of millions. uh, I shouldn't maybe not millions, but thousands and thousands of people. 
and the baskets are running up and down the aisle. And that's just an f- extreme example. But I just hope you're getting the picture when it comes to these men who are corrupt in the Word of God and they're not suffering. And Paul's coming along and saying, I have the authority for edification and I am suffering. And he goes down through that list. The one thing I want to talk about this list, I don't want to go through it much uh, in deep. And then in the next session, we'll get into chapter 12. But look at this issue here in verse 26. He's talked about a lot of things about his sufferings. And this is what he means when he says, are they ministers of Christ? Back up in verse 23, I speak as a fool. I am more. How is he more of a minister of Christ? He's going to talk about in his labors and his stripes. And he's going to go on and give his his suffering accolades, uh, as it were. But look at verse 26. He says, In journeyings often, in perils of water. And notice how he repeats this issue of perils. Come back with me real quick to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 35, we went through this verse. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he gives a list. And we saw this list is progressive in nature. Uh, and the who is the adversary and his cohorts are going to come along and produce tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness. Or what's that next one? Peril. Or peril. And come back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll just kind of give this disclaimer. I'm still studying this out. But this issue of perils, it's almost, I'm, I'm more going on the side right now because I don't have the proof and the backing of it. So I'll just, I want to make sure that you see this, that it's more of my opinion than anything. But when he starts again, this issue of perils, it's almost as if, I don't want to say it's almost as if the sufferings of this present time and the sufferings of Christ are converging. And the sufferings of this present time, Paul starts to recognize them of what he's going through, these these perils, as coming directly from the adversary. I don't know if that makes that makes any sense, but we looked at those sufferings at this present time as just something that's common to man, something that we're all going to face, uh, and that they're just kind of happening. But it seems like this peril issue is the adversary taking what he has at his disposal according to the course of this world and those sufferings that just happen, and that he has a, some kind of capacity to bring that peril upon the Apostle Paul. And again, that's just kind of something I've been studying now, but I think it's an interesting issue because there's some suffering this present time he's going through, but then he uses this issue of perils and that he's already explained in Romans 8 that's in that list that the adversary is going to produce. Well, there's a lot of perils that are taking place uh, there in those verses. Again, you could probably uh, persuade me otherwise on that, uh, but it is an interesting uh, issue nevertheless. Again, he gives his pedigree of, or his accolades of suffering to prove that he is more of a minister of Christ than these other guys. And in chapter 12, he's going to come along and kind of give his last profound explanation and his boast, as it were, or his glorying when it comes to his ability and what he's seen and what he's experienced as he went into the third heaven and how he doesn't glory in that, but he glories in his infirmities. And these other ministers of Christ are definitely not doing this, nor do they have at their disposal this experience that it even matches the, what the Apostle Paul went through to give his concluding argument of why they should listen to Paul as their authority and not these other men. And par- therefore partake in the sufferings be comforted in them and be like their Apostle Paul, what he's going to get to in chapter 12 and take pleasure in them. But we'll get into that next Thursday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time uh, to get into your word and look at this issue uh, 
Father, we just quickly surveyed these things. I pray that they would uh, prick our curiosity in our thoughts so that we would individually and on our own time uh, study these issues out. But, Father, nevertheless, we are thankful for your word, that it works effectually in us, especially in this issue of suffering, and that we can manifest and experience uh, you as the, the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies, uh, and that we can experience that superior power being put on display in sufferings, although we may not feel it, taste it, touch it, uh, or see it, but we can understand with the eyes of understanding, with that spirit of faith that is taking place, and glory in what's taking place uh, in the suffering, with your word working effectually in us. Father, we thank you for all these things that you have given to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I thank you for your Son, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, that he, how that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And if anyone is not trusted exclusively in him as their all-sufficient Savior, I pray that they would do so now. Let them move a muscle, pray a prayer, give a tithe, go to church, any of those things. But do the only non-meritorious thing that they can do, and that is have faith in Christ. Faith is trusting in someone else to do for you that which you can't do for yourself. I pray that they would believe in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he did at Calvary right now. Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully, according as your word work effectually in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.